Good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us today. And I have to apologize for my uh, co-presenter, Nicole, because uh, she's not here today because for the fact that she has to take, um, you know, cover somebody in the office for having a sick child. So she couldn't uh, be present with us today to present to you all. But I'm here and we're excited to share some of the work we are doing in Iowa 4-H, um, uh, which is a youth development program. And, uh, you know, before I go into the presentation, I would like to thank uh, Japana Kilog and everyone in the planning team for their hard work in putting together this I-Score conference every year, uh, very, very authentically asking uh, people to present from around the campus, and I really appreciate that. And uh, I'm Ani, I serve the role of diversity, inclusion, professional development specialist at uh, Iowa 4-H Extension and Outreach. Um, and in my role, I coordinate uh, two programs. Uh, one of them is called the Access Equity Belonging Committee, which consists of staff. And uh, the other program that I, I coordinate is called the Team Influencers for Equity and Inclusion. So these are the two programs that I do. And I'm very much committed to this topic of uh, you know, youth voice and equity. This is very extremely important for me and uh, for my why that I'm engaged in this work, because um, as an immigrant uh, woman, the equity is very important because just to see that how other immigrant youths can be connected to this program, which is really a good program for youth engagement. And um, also like, you know, as being part of extension, um, the mission connects with me very well serving all Iowans. And I'm also very grateful that my role allows me to um, do this work that I do around youth equity or staff equity and things like that. So I'm really excited to be here. Um, <clears throat> oh, I have to use this one, sorry. Um, uh, you know, I again would like to share the mission of NSCORE and ISCORE. The NSCORE ISCORE project supports Iowa State University's diversity effort. The project provides positive interaction and dialogue regarding race, ethnicity, and multicultural relation through local and national initiatives, including participation in two conferences, NCORE, which is the National Conference on Race and Ethnicity, and ISCORE, which is the Iowa State Conference for on Race and Ethnicity. And um, the planning team really wants uh, you all to check in using the Hoover app so that they have a good sense of how many people joined for this presentation. And so they, they would like to keep tab of that. And before we move forward, I would like to, I would like you all to give a minute to kind of acknowledge the land um, that we are currently using and we need to recognize the, the people who took care of the land and um, you know, understand that this land was taken away from them. And you know, we all say that we are not there that time, we are not part of the history, but as uh, Dr. Beverly Tendum says, even though we are not part of the history, we are breathing on it. So it's very important that we recognize and acknowledge the land that we are in. So the goals of this presentation is like to understand uh, basically how to use youth voice um, in your program planning and incorporating in all aspects of programming and then providing an example to show how we have done it, uh, especially around um, you know, organizational development or building capacity for equity. Uh, when I say that, I mean that how can we expand the 4-H audience to all youths? So that's what like, and so, you know, we can do that, but, you know, having youth along the way to support that effort has been very meaningful for us. And so we would like to share that. And in that, like, we would like to share why it's important, what are some strategies to do that? And we would again, provide examples of how we assessing that we are doing good or bad or where we stand. So that's kind of our goal. Um, I know that um, uh, to some of the university audience, 
uh, you all may not know 4-H. So um, just a little bit about 4-H. 4-H is the extension wing of Iowa, Iowa State University. Extension means their primary goal is to reach all, uh, all people across the state. And they do it in four ways. One is through 4-H, which is a youth development program that focuses on attending to the youth audience. Then they have a human science that focuses on family audience. Then they also have community economic development that fo focuses on communities and tries to see how communities can be thriving and vibrant. And then they also have the ag and natural resource. So these are the four wings of uh, extension and outreach. And so I, I, our work, or because we focus on youth development, we are primarily from the Iowa 4-H Youth Development Program. Uh, <clears throat> just a little bit about Iowa 4-H. Um, it's a national organization, in fact, an international organization around the country and the globe. We serve uh, 60 million youths, and our primary goal is like strong local, state, and national infrastructure that uh, kind of uh, creates the creates a pathway for outreach um, to support community efforts. We focus or we use all the time research-based uh, curriculums, and we have multiple delivery methods to do that. For example, some could be after-school program, or it could be a community circle, or it could be like, you know, like um, a distant and virtual and hybrid. So we use multiple ways to kind of attend to this uh, needs of youth audiences. 4-H has been very flexible in meeting local needs, realizing that each community is different, the youth from their community can be different. And uh, so the cookie cutter programs are not what uh, 4-H seeks for. So each of the programs have some basic components that are essential when we are providing 4-H uh, programming. That is uh, positive youth development. So viewing youth as positive, that means they have strengths to make meet their goals and uh, they have strengths to accomplish what they want to do in their life. And then um, some of the <clears throat> essential elements of, or youth needs that we focus on are youth belonging, mastery, independence, and generosity. And then our essential element are built into our programming, which includes caring adults or volunteers or leaders, safe environment and inclusive setting. Our program priorities are around STEM, healthy living, leadership and civic engagement, and communication and arts. Um, finally, um, you know, we hope that, you know, at the, after participating in 4-H programs, our youths are productive citizens, are outstanding communicators and effective leaders, and are successful learners. So um, according to national study, uh, the outcomes of 4-H participation has been that when youths who participate in 4-H programming have an improved preparedness for college and career, and they have um, and they are engaged more engaged civically, and they are also very active in STEM activities, and they are more likely to make healthier choices in their food and their lifestyle. And also they, there is a higher likely that they are going to give back to the community because our projects are connected to the communities. And so youths are always trying to see that how uh, we can give back to a community or the project that I am doing, how is it going to be helpful for my community? So those are some of the ways of closing the achievement and opportunity gap also. So, um, and then looking at who is the audience of Iowa 4-H, um, because I, I shared with you that we serve uh, 60 million youths, um, you know, um, sorry, 6 million youths um, across the um, country, but then who are the participants of Iowa 4-H? Uh, how many do we serve? In Iowa, we serve 100,000 youths and that support supported by 8,000 adult volunteers and leaders. Um, and then uh, just to kind of keep you all informed that, you know, who are these, uh, you know, who are these uh, people whom we serve? Like you can see there are 2.6 million uh, are rural, 6 million participants out of the 6 million, 1.6 million are suburban and 1.8 million are urban. So this is how most of the time, um, you know, youths have been uh, shared out. Um, but then um, 
So what's missing from this uh, data or the sharing of information? So if you think about what is missing and what are we attending to the demographic, how are we attending to the demographic shift in our community and in our country? What does this demographic shift mean for 4-H policies? That's something to kind of think about, like, you know, um, 4-H is often charged to kind of uh, make sure that our population are um, a reflection of our communities. But, um, but, who, but is that sometimes easy? So sharing a bit of context, um, it is the social realities and uh, with compassion and future youth audience needs while we still maintain our heritage because yes, there is a changing demographics happening in our communities, in our counties, but then um, our primary clientele is the white cisgender uh, rural uh, youth and we can't move away completely from their needs but at the same time, we need to accommodate the new audiences that are coming to our communities. And so um, our forage has been engaging youths for over hundreds of years, but then again, to be relevant, to be sustainable, to be, um, you know, uh, to exist, we need to be uh, rapidly growing our ethnically diverse uh, population that are underrepresented in our programs. So, we feel a big part of um, that can be accomplished through our youth. Uh, a big part, because a big part of forage programming is the youth adult partnerships. And uh, so we believe that, you know, if we could involve and incorporate the inputs of youths from these different marginalized groups in our decision points of the organization, initiatives, programs, and conversations and planning, then we can reach all of these uh, new audiences that are coming into our, uh, our communities. Um, that's kind of our uh, major uh, takeaway in this. And so, because when in 4-H world, youth adult partnership is a big thing. So, but in reality, youth adult partnership can fall a wide range of spectrum. For example, it may mean just you are aware that a youth is here and that you need to engage them and explore their ideas and skills um, and uh, make sure that we value their experiences. But is that true youth adult partnership then? Um, and then, you know, some would say, take a step further and say that, oh, you know, we need to make uh, the recommendations from the youth and field study meaningful roles in decision-making bodies by putting them in different ambassador roles and youth and adults collaborate to create and to kind of prioritize goals and develop strategies for positive change. Yes, that is definitely a step further. But then, um, how are we in? But I, how are how are we sharing the power? So that is kind of the crucial part there. That you know, we involve youth in all these ambassador programs or these leadership roles. But there is some adult who is directing them. So what we are trying to say when we when we talk about incorporating youth voice, we are talking about the shared power, the equitable shared with, with that is equitably shared with the youth. Youth are taking part in decision making. They are in the you know they are in the table where policies are made, where decisions are made, and so that will allow youth to kind of have a driven to thrive, and they'll have self awareness. They have the skills to initiate change and also experience extrinsic motivation and sense of purpose to follow through. So when youth-driven care is embraced, uh, youth have mutual respect and relationship with adults and other youth in the community as they partner for change. So that's what we're trying to hope that, you know, the program that, is, that we will be talking about, how we've tried to use that. Um, then, um, so, um, what does this mean for Iowa Forage? Yes, it means that to address the disparities to meet the today's changing uh, demographics and also understand the current realities and accommodate to the rapidly growing ethnically diverse population that remains underrepresented in our programs. And also most importantly, we need to be innovative in meeting the needs of future youth audiences, especially those who are new to our communities because those that's incorporating that voice, engaging youth to challenge, um, you know, and to respond to the injustice that they face, because we have to give them that space where they can come, they can share, 
that this is not how we are feeling included. That's when, if we can create that space for them, if we can allow them to speak and have a voice, that's when they can share with us. Okay, these are some of the things that I need for my community and that most extending, that will be like extending a positive youth development work to critiquing power and to promoting social change. That's when we can do those things so that a collective action can be met um, that, that is based on the needs of this new client. And so that, so that, again, we will remain sustainable and in business. So that's why I think this is so important, like how we involve youth voice and then how can we, um, and, and we can see the changes that happens with that. Um, what is meant by centering of youth voice? Youth voice speaks to the involvement um, of ideas, uh, thinking, opinion, decisions of the youth. And when I say centering, it means incorporating the input of youth in decision-making, um, in organization, planning, conversations, program, policy development, everything, incorporating the input of, again, you know, it can fall from various, but allowing them to be the true stakeholders and contributors in various aspects of the organization. If we are a youth serving organization, our youths are our number one stakeholders. We need to have them at the table. If it's not about them, if it's not with them, it's not about them, right? So we need to understand that part very much. So an equitable partnership, again, means truly centering youth voice and moving power being equitably shared with youth and adults. So how, um, how is it impactful in having youth voice? So um, based on research, what we have seen is that um, when we have youth voice in um, throughout a project or a process, then the voice of lived experiences are highlighted in the system, the practice strength and improvement that is needed. So we can identify that, you know, how is a program meeting the needs of the community or where is the gap? What is the communication gap? What services are needed readily? So we can have a much more wider understanding because it comes from the lived experiences of the youth. And, you know, we have a way of solving the problem, but when we ask youth, they have a unique perspective on policy and program development. Some things may seem so hard for us to change, but the way they talk about it, it just some seems so easy and so natural, and that will allow us to have more accountability to kind of solve these problems because they will give us that unique perspective. Why don't you do this and that? And innovative ideas with potential improvement for all our youths. Like, you know, um, when extension of 4-H was created, it was like youths were given the idea that, you know, the university has these research and these research will share with you how you can improve your yield. And the parents were like, no, we, the adults, you know, in the community, like, no, we don't want to take that risk because we don't know who they are, what they know about farming. And the youths are like, let's take the chance. And they took the chance and they could see that the 60% increase in their yield. And that's their innovation because they are risk takers also. They would try to find ways that can allow them to see that how change can happen. And they will definitely try it out. And that's the beauty of having youth in your system or allowing youths to be part of it. The innovative ideas with potential to improve outcomes for all youths, that's always there. Like if, if, it's, if it works for them, it might work for others too. Um, and again, the perspective on youth needs and priorities comes from that lived experience, which can impact the larger system because um, the system is created like for each system, works for the people for whom it was created. But with the new audience coming in, it may not work because the things that is needed for the traditional audience may not be a need for the new audience. So how can we inform the new audience or how, how can we understand what's the need of the new audience? And that's more powerful and that can come from um, the youths. And again, the context and feedback that reflect the needs of the community um, the, uh, the organizations they serve, because it may work that this particular group may it work well uh, for this particular group uh, for this kind of delivery, but it may not work for all deliveries. Like, you know, I'm telling you, we're working with a group of youths and we thought that this virtual programming will work for all youths so that because they're all across the state. But we soon realized that 
youths do not have um, the facility to connect with us virtually. So we learned that, oh, that is not the most efficient way of delivering this message that we are trying to do. Um, having said that, you know, these are all the impactful ways. Um, we do encounter challenges in incorporating youth voice also in our organizational practices. Some of them being like, you know, selecting the youth because not all youth are interested to come in and be engaged with us and share with us what they need from us. Not all youths are interested to do that. Um, and then also scheduling restrictions. Like, you know, I work with uh, some youths who are from the Ames community. They are so involved in so many different things that trying to set up a time to meet with them is such a challenging thing. So that is also to think about. Sometimes when you're like, you know, as I was talking to you, I was working with a community that had youths who do not have the facilities or the uh, scope to kind of um, participate with us because they had financial constraints. They did not have computers, they did not have phone to connect with us. A lot of the times, like even if you say that, okay, I'm opening the extension office because we are in all the 99 counties, we'll say that, okay, we'll open the extension office for you. Still, it's not helpful for them because they do not have transportation. How will they come to the extension office to kind of uh, learn about the programming? And again, it's also very challenging sometimes to find these youths who would have long-term commitment and engagement to participate with us. So that's all, these are some of the challenges of working with uh, you know, youth. And then the other thing I feel is um, sometimes the system doesn't work for us to work together because we do not have staff capacity to work or give them the true scope of partnerships that you know the authentic relationship that we don't have trained staff who understand what it means to have authentic relationships so you feel um, alienated and they just walk away so that's something to remember so these are some of the challenges you know um, how it uh, how it can be impactful and how it is also a challenge um, to incorporate youth voice but we still feel that incorporating youth voice is important. And here are some um, studies that have shown some success indicators. One being that the change in attitude, youth feel that they can influence in the decision that affect them. So that gives them a sense of empowerment, you know, like to thrive, to make change, and they're the agents of change. And adults feel that youth are competent and effective in decision-making. Um, enthusiasm youth and adults are actively engaged in programming and share ownership of activities. Youth show evidence of thriving. Like um, within 4-H, we have many um, you know, ambassador programs, just like the one that we will be talking about. But in those programs, most of the decisions are made by the adults in the program and youths participate in this. And in our program, um, youths tell that, hey, can, can I facilitate this activity? Can I do this? So that, that gives, a, gives us a lot of pride and joy to say that we have given that space to the youth so that they feel that they can do the same as us. So they, that, that gives us a lot of pride. And again, you know, having uh, working with marginalized youth and having them as a liaison for us is an excellent recruitment and retention um, uh, tool and uh, strategy because it increases the as a result of youth communicating positively about their experiences to the peers. Um, that is something again we have learned over time that you know with their engagement with us they feel so empowered that within uh, the first month of their participation they will bring four other youths and say that can my friend participate with you. Um, and so an adult share confidence also in partnering with youth and mentoring new adult members. So that again, gives a sense of competence for adults to feel that, okay, I can do this. And then if, and also if she can do it, I can do it kind of thing. And again, programming, it really includes active engagement from the youth and the adults. Both come together, both participate, both share ideas. Both are like learning and unlearning and relearning. So that's the beauty of this uh, activity of engaging youth in, um, um, in your programming. But again, we just thought that also it's important for us to share that how does the community benefit in this? Because youth participating as a strong voice in a youth serving organization, which is like extension is so powerful because we are in all the 99 counties and when youth come and talk to their community members that this is a good program, let's that, that trust comes in naturally. 
and that helps in community planning and organizing. Communities with involved youth report less violence and enhance overall public health. And then um, adults need to be willing to share power and responsibility. Um, and then, you know, youth need to be willing to accept responsibility and accountability also. And both adults and youth need to skills to successfully work together. Those are some of the biases that we have, like we need to check our assumptions that and trust those people that we are working with. And it also addresses barriers because accommodate youth schedules when planning meetings or ensuring transportation or meeting locations are acceptable for all youth. So those are all you know, important how, how to make our organizations much more uh, accessible and beneficial for all people. And then again, the biggest uh, thing in this is like the sustaining partnerships, that the shared decision making, um, like you know, creating with this youth, uh, youth team really opens up lots of discussions from the youth about their needs. And then that we do not sometimes understand that. Like we were recently doing um, assessment, needs assessment with young people from Strom Lake. We thought that they would say some things, you know, like that um, they need more programs, they need more computers, things like that. They shared with us that they need resources to be in college. They, they shared with us that they do not have resources. They do not know how to come to Iowa State. They do not know how scholarships are, you know, how they can write those letters. How can they get scholarships? What are some things that they can do to connect to Iowa State? That was their number one need. So we didn't think about it. They really busted our assumption saying that, oh, we don't need anything that you're thinking. We don't need anything from you. We just need you to tell us what's the connection for us? What's the network? How do we go to Iowa State? So that's something um, uh, to keep in mind because they work as a liaison for your organization. Uh, they, they will be like you know, your voice and they will be sharing. If they have a good experience, they'll share about it. Um, in chat, I would just ask you to give an example of a program or project you've been involved with that has successfully engaged youth. What made it successful? Just like if two points or something, if you can write, then that would be very kind. Or if you can unmute yourself and share anything, that would be nice too. I'm asking Sarah to kind of take note of any responses if they have come in the chat, because I don't uh, want to like um, close my session here. You can unmute yourself and share if you have an idea that you've worked on and it's been successful. I could share. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm Marna Yando Nelson, and um, I have a research lab on campus. And sometimes we participate in Science Bound at Iowa State, uh, which is a program that uh, works with STEM underrepresented uh, middle school and high school students. And it seems that they do an excellent job of engaging youth um, by working with that the 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 students themselves and also the parents and having a wide variety of um, programming. Thank you, Marna, for sharing. Sarah, do you see any comments in the chat box that you can share with us? I'm not seeing any either in Zoom or in Whova, but I will uh, share them as they come in. Okay. I see one on art force in the chat. I, uh, awesome. I clicked mm -hmm. on that. There seems to be two places you can find the chat. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Marna, for uh, jumping in and sharing. Yeah, art force is a very good program. That's the way that uh, you uh, you know partner with incarcerated youths to kind of involve them in chat in art and uh, and you know engage them. That is really powerful. Um, okay. <clears throat> Uh, well, I'm going to now take some time to explain um, our program 
It's called the Teen Influencers for Equity and Inclusion. Uh, Teen Influencers for Equity and Inclusion is a unique leadership opportunity in the areas of equity, inclusion, diversity, justice within Iowa 4-H program. This is a pilot program. This is our pilot year. And um, it's kind of the main job of these youths are like the youth voice or the wing of access, equity, belonging committee. And I think I had shared this earlier, like um, I facilitate or I, like I'm the coordinator also for the access, equity, belonging committee. So when I started working on that program, um, like we are building capacity for our staff to be inclusive. But then my first thing was that, hmm, where is our biggest clientele or biggest stakeholder in this? So that's when we brought, thought that, you know, youths need to be involved in these committees too. And then when I reached out to youth, especially from the marginalized communities, they shared that, oh, I'm not a leader. I can't come and do that. I cannot open my voice and share with, you know, with adults that they need to do this or that. That gave me you're like, oh, <laughs> and then I, I told them that, you know, you all are leaders. You do so many things for your communities, for your families that normal people do to kind of fill up their resumes. You do this authentically every day of your life. And but they expressed that, you know, you know, we could do this if you could share with us some, you know, some programming that will improve our communication skills, our talking for ourselves. So that's how this Teen Leaders for Equity Institute, sorry, Teen Influencers for Equity and Inclusion came about. So what we do is that we, uh, um, these are youths from seven through 11 graders. We have 23 youths in the program who have joined as liaison, but every month they participate with us um, and we focus on the community capital model. And in that they try to learn every month a, a capital and then they go back and engage in their communities. So that the project that we do with them or they work with us on that, they go back and implement or experiment back that back uh, in their communities uh, in it. So that's kind of one of the ways we kind of work through this program. Um, <clears throat> and you can see that this is how our map has been. Um, that's how like um, they have been spread out from the different parts of Iowa. Um, and um, with the, you know, with the teen influencer, our primary focus has been that how we can seek to extend the positive dev youth development work, because um, again, bringing in the social justice lens to positive youth development work, because um, uh, th 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 that's kind of very important that uh, the youths from the marginalized communities are recognized in this work and that a promising practice is to embrace the social justice, which encourages youth to challenge um, you know, the, and respond to the injustices they face, uh, become assets to their community and agents of change. So Teen Influencer Program is based on that social justice youth development uh, model that seeks to extend the positive youth development to work in critiquing power, in promoting systemic social change and encouraging collective action. For example, in 4-H uh, programming, we have a leadership role that we assign to youth. We have 40 uh, council members who represent from different uh, communities. And, but the application of that is that you have to be a lifelong 4 -H -er. But many of our marginalized youth come from uh, backgrounds or families that have just immigrated to the US. How are they going to have this lifelong opportunity? So that's what the youth uh, question about. And this teen influencer program came about for that. Like, you know, how can we create opportunity for all youth? Um, and again, by participating in the program, uh, they understand the institutional inequality and the social stratifications that exist in the program they love so much. Um, and then they are able to raise those issues, um, identify that how these issues are not meaningful to their lives, to their own communities. How can we focus issues that is important for all youths? And then they empower to question the actions that are grounded in critical reflection and perception. That is something that the youths have said over and over again, that most of the time, um, the policies uh, or the events that we invite them to be part of is much more just like a talk. The action is not grounded in critical reflection. And uh, so, so they, they seriously believe that this action and reflection should go together so that it's much more authentic rather than just taking, uh, just doing the talk and not the walk. Um, 
And again, like, you know, um, youth talked, you know, like the most important thing in this, the youth adult partnership. We've talked about, like I just shared with you, like how youths feel so competent to say that, hey, I'm going to facilitate this session today and I'm going to do this. Let me go and do that. So what we do as staff is provide them the opportunities like, you know, hey, this is coming up. Would you be interested to participate? Um, then they were like, no. And then we do a little bit of nudge on them. Hey, you can do it. It's not a big deal. You've done this project. You've done that project. And then like, you did, oh, I can do it. Oh, I'll do this. I'll do that. And then they talk about it. So um, uh, I'll be talking more about the examples of how they participate. But again, then again, that um, that idea that, you know, not all the time that they have to, you know, like, I, I don't know, some of you must be aware of that Roger Hart's, uh, the, the la ladder that he talks about, that uh, the framework of thinking how young people's participation and engagement in community-based efforts, programs, and systems. Like, you know, he talks about that and he talks about like, like not all the time that youths have to reach, have that highest level of engagement, but they should be given that opportunity to participate in that highest level. So that is the most empowering thing in this, that the authentic youth adult partnership where you create space for youths to lead, to take charge. Um, so that's what, again, like, you know, comes to that next, uh, uh, point here, the intentional youth engagement, that again, kind of reflects on uh, why are you engaging, always asking them that why, why are you engaging, um, and you're reflecting who needs to be engaged. On our part, we always constantly think who needs to be engaged, who is missing from this discussion, who understands the history that who needs to be engaged, where, to, where do we start together? These are some things that we work with them. You are, I mean, there, there has to be that genuine intent, that approach, that purpose in your ask to them. And then you can see that, you know, that's how we focus on this program, the Teen Influencers. Uh, so the youth engage with us for a year, as I shared with you, they participate in the, you know, the community capital model each year focusing on each month focusing on a capital which we do virtually and then we meet with them at least four retreats they come to meet with us in person four times a week four, four times throughout the year and um, they also have adult mentors helping them to kind of come through the project accomplish the projects and then they also serve as a liaison for the access equity belonging committee we have five uh, committees there one is the LGBT youth, the refugee and immigrant, and then we have uh, youth with different abilities, disabilities. We also have um, uh, mental health, and then we also have foster care, youth from foster care system. These are the five areas that we focus on the Access Equity Belonging Committee, and youths are liaison to these committees also because they share the information that they see in their community and the need for these groups. To the, uh, to the Access Equity Belonging Committee. So it's like a back and forth communication that happens so that that helps them. And I'm gonna show with, share with you like some of the examples, like for example, um, when we had the social capital class, uh, the youths uh, participated in a poetry writing, uh, uh, comp, you know, like a session and they all wrote poetries based on what is, uh, what have they learned or um, how does that make them feel to be part of uh, the teen influencers? Uh, so this is what um, Anika Shatria has written on that in that social capital engagement class was that, I wish I learned in school that it was okay and normal to overthink and scrutinize everything you do that rather than learning from your mistakes, you learn how to deal with making mistakes. So she, you know, all the youths wrote poetry and this was her poetry, like some things that you have learned as being part of uh, teen influence or she was writing that poetry about it. Um, and then we, last month we visited uh, Iowa State because it was their in-person retreat. Uh, they visited Iowa State. We visited the, the different centers of uh, research centers in Iowa State. Uh, for example, the virtual reality application center, Student Innovation Center, we visited the Papa John's Center for Entrepreneurship, then we visited the Maker Space and School of Ed. So this was one of the experiences they participated in uh, seeing the this project was created, uh, it's, I think it's called the C6 project created for uh, the Boeing company and then the youths participated in it, trying to see and how to feel like when the flight comes in and all that. So they experienced that. And then we had a session in January on political capital 
where we had Mary Beth Tinker come and speak to them. This is the case that Tinker was versus Des Moines. Um, the case happened when um, you know she wore a black band to uh, school when she was in middle school um, to revolt against the Vietnam War and how she was uh, asked to kind of step go out go home, and then she you know you know st stood against it and that became a law. So you shared that how participating in this, they really got to know the insider story of history and they really appreciated that. So um, University of uh, Portland has come up with this assessment of measuring youth voice. So they have this, um, this overall uh, themes. It's called the overall vision and commitment, collaborative approach, empowered representatives, commitment to and facilitation of support, workforce development, participation in developing programs and policies, participation in evaluation and leading initiatives and projects. So um, like overall, they want to see, or want us to assess our programs in a way that are our overall pol policies and procedures in place to support meaningful youth engagement? Uh, are young people treated as valued partners in decision-making process? Are young people supported the way that will maximize their potential? Um, is the organization investing resources to support youth voice? And then um, um, are staff trained to work collaboratively with youth and adults? And then is there evidence young people are having impact on how programs and services work? And then are there young people engaged in how well the, you know, the youth serving organization is doing in its work? And then finally, um, do they have agency support that youth and young adults to take lead in projects that they would design. So that's like something um, is some of this um, ways of assessment that is intended to see that how youths uh, are offered the opportunity to reflect on the current, uh, current practices and opportunities for improvement. So that's how we will break down some of the uh, impacts that our program has had on the youths in incorporating youth boys. Um, so, um, we, we chose four of the themes here, uh, overall vision and commitment, workforce development, leading initiatives and projects and empowered representative. Uh, Grant, uh, so youth, uh, the seventh or eighth graders, it is really fascinating for them to apply for grant, write the grant and get the grant on their own. They take a huge pride in that. So last year they wrote a grant it's a very small amount, but for them, it's a big deal. $500 is a big deal for them. They got a grant of $500 to create awareness and peer support for LGBT and BIPOC youth. So for that, they kind of um, uh, did a survey for in their school. Like there were hundreds of participants who participated and who shared what is the staff needs. I mean, what's the adult need in creating awareness and what is the youth needs in creating awareness? So that, you know, so, and then, um, then they participated in national fellowship programs. Like they were one of the 15 teams selected to be part of a national program. Through that, they uh, have to do like a research. So they're uh, assessing youth belongingness. So it's again, a participatory evaluation research that they are doing. And then they have done recruitment. So they have gone and uh, shared the work that they are doing with their peers and their friends have joined with us. They have presented at facilitated sessions at youth summit at also uh, community youth equity summits in Boone Library, they facilitated that. So they take on all the things about workshop and training. What I do as staff, I provide them the, the training that, um, you know, that, that is encour encouraging to me, taking some good curriculums and sharing it with them. And then they take it on from there. So we were having a discussion on equity. They took it on there. They included, uh, you know, data disparities in participation. They included everything to share that, you know, what are they, they included games so to kind of make people understand what they are doing. So that's how they have taken the lead on. And you trained as facilitators for equity dialogues, like which I was just telling you about. Training is entirely facilitated by the youth for the youth and adults. And again, the uh, facilitated discussion framework for gathering feedbacks on first generation youth experiences in 4-H. And again, purpose is to identify needs and gaps in local communities so that our program and policy changes. So these feedbacks are used in program and policy changes. They're also reviewing the youth code of conduct because every uh, youth serving organization has a code of conduct, how youth needs to behave. 
and what are some things they need to do if there is a disruption, how the organization will handle. So they are reviewing that. They're also reviewing the core principle document, which is a document used to uh, staff uh, training so that because the, the, they are the primary stakeholders, they are reviewing that to share that, okay, you are telling them this, but you didn't mention that. Can you mention that? So that uh, they have an equal say in how staff are getting trained. Um, again, like, you know, these are some youths who are in Storm Lake area. They have participated in expanding the Storm workforce development. Like we have, it's part through NSF grant where uh, faculty members are going out to the communities to understand the STEM needs of youth. So youths have been the primary source of contact there. Our teen influences are the primary source of contact. They are reaching out to their community members. They are going and bringing youths to the table to share what is the STEM needs. How can Iowa State improve on programming to help uh, youth be part of the STEAM workforce? Again, partnering with schools and community organization to enhance the collaboration with Iowa State and to volunteer to review youth engagement and youth events, because that's very important. We have so many events, but the youth, the events are not culturally relevant that meets the youth needs. So they're reviewing those events also. And they are also presenting at national forums, like for example, a bunch of youths will be presenting at the Des Moines Civil and Human Rights Symposium. And then some, some youths are pre presented, I think last month at the Environment Summit. So uh, they're doing some number of things that can, you know, that can help them to be impactful. Uh, and, uh, and for us to see how youth voice can be impactful in, in the work we are doing and how we can make it uh, impactful. I think um, just to kind of share as a best practice or strategies for centering on youth voice is that, you know, research says that cultivating youth voice and agency affects youth development positively and efforts to increase voice and agency makes a difference in attitude, behaviors and engagement of all youth. But did you know that uh, youth improved academically when they, uh, when they had competence in one aspect of their life also because of that increasing youth voice? help them to re-engage. And also students report valued um, in uh, when having a better relationship with their teacher. Um, and increasing youth voice also improves students' understanding of how they learn. So that also is very impactful for any organization if we could have partner with the youths and have their voice in, uh, in everything we do. Youth can also act as a source of social capital, especially when you're working with marginalized BIPOC communities leading them to further educational and employment and enrichment opportunities. We have seen that so much in our work that, you know, how youths kind of build that social capital, build that network to bring other youths to be part of this opportunity. And um, I think it also gives them a sense of identity, a culture, you know, like, it's like, I am that person, I belong to that group, they wear it very proudly that uh, the part that they, in the, for the 4-H, uh, the teen influencer aspect of it. So they, they you can see that, that, that sense of competence when, um, I think, you know, as a program, I would just like to say that how any youth serving organization uh, can engage youth in effective and practical ways is like, you know, first of all, uh, prepare youth for success by developing our goals lesson plans and curricula for youth engagement, but involve youth in the planning process. And I can say that, you know, all our documents that we used even to recruit youths, to nominate youths have were reviewed by you. Even the name Teen Influencer for Equity and Inclusion, some adults laughed at me that, how can you give this kind of name? I'm like, I didn't give that name. That name was given by teen and teens. I, I worked on different things. Like, what would you like to call yourself? Like I send that out to different parts of this country and youths wrote back to me saying that we would like to be called influencers because we are influencing. We don't want to be called ambassadors. We don't want to be called anything adult kind of name. We want to be called influencers. So everything that, uh, in every paperwork was kind of started from the very beginning with youth perspective, youth voice in every aspect of it. Um, and again, you know, uh, I think a big part that I think we will be focusing this year is providing more training and tools for staff to engage. Like there are few of us who engage very effectively, efficiently with youth. All youths engage with them, but then again, that 
that the notion of the cultural sensitivity part needs to be much more trained. We, need, we will have to improve on that. We've been doing some, but I think that needs to improve a lot more. And again, build community by establishing a supportive environment that fosters that sense of belonging, uh, that interdependence, that positive relationship. When youth come and tell you that, hey, I want to facilitate this month's session. Can you help me? Or can we do this? Can we do that? And we are like, go for it. You do it. It's your session, you know? And that, again, the other youths are very engaged when a youth is facilitating the session also. We've seen that. But we try to always, uh, like, you know, when I was invited to be a keynote speaker for the Boone Equity Summit, I said that I don't need to do this. My youths can speak, you know? That was, uh, like, we just have to create that multiple ways that we can engage youth um, where the activities are developmentally appropriate. So these were like, you know, eighth graders, ninth graders, and, you know, sorry, ninth graders, 10th graders, and 12th graders. And they were easily able to maneuver and talk about, uh, facilitate the session on equity. Again, value time and contribution of young people by taking their recommendations seriously, because they, even they are giving you time, which means you have to be very serious. I see Celine here, and uh, you know we've talked a lot about how we can contribute the youths for their participation. Uh, that is again another thing that you know we would like to work more. That how we can contribute youth for their time, for their voice, for work that they do with for us. And again, as an, an organizational culture, we have to be vulnerable. When uh, as adults, we need to listen. If we have invited them, we need to listen to them. It should not be just checking the box of inviting them. It actually listening to them and um, you know, continue to collect and sharing examples, how, um, you know, how organizations work well when they want to include youth and how we can do that. So I think that's what would be some of our strategies. Again, do not forget to evaluate the session using Hoover app. But I am here, like, you know, if you have questions, I would love to answer any of your questions. And I so much appreciate your time to participate and please unmute yourself and ask me questions. And I'm going to stop sharing so that I can see you all and uh, talk to you all. There's too many information to cover and uh, my friend was not here so I had to um, rush in several places but if you have questions please answer uh, please ask me I'm here and um, uh, I think I see a, a comment from Nancy um, at our best building youth adult partnership in out of school time settings edited by okay are you sharing an article a journal article that was just i'd put a, another book in the chat as well um these are just two books that i've read that i found really useful on this topic and um so the second one the building youth adult partnerships and out of school time is an edited volume um with multiple scholars including bianca baldridge who um, i recommended her solo book which is called reclaiming community Mm -hmm. that talk a, a lot about the things that you're that you're already talking about but just add another context to it thank you yeah you know uh, this uh, reading all these uh, you know excellent work and you know there's a lot of work uh, journal articles on this topic but you know bringing that research into practice was so um, it was so empowering, I can say that, like, you know, how you do that and always constantly learning from young people was also valuable. Like, you know, with, with the expressions and things, you can really know where, uh, what you are doing wrong or how you are missing the boat. And they will tell you if, you if you ask them that, you know, they will tell you and that's very powerful. There are a few questions um, in Whova that I'll go ahead and ask. One was from Alan. What is the percentage of minority students participating in this program? Um, this program is specifically designed for minority students. So all the students who participate in here are students of color or they are from LGBT communities or they have um, or their allies for mental health or something like that. 
And then the next one from uh, Stephanie is, is this something that other states are also doing? No, other states do not have exactly a program that's called Teen Influencers because every state does their own thing. But I think a lot of the states are trying to create, um, uh, you know, like a youth activist or um, advocacy body. They are trying to create that. Like Washington state has a, a big advocacy body that uh, they work a lot around LGBT issues. Um, so they focus on a few things, but what we've been doing is much more like project oriented that youths want to work on and really give them a real time experience. Like for example, we just say that go do this, you know, like if you are interested in this, these are some of the ways we can work on it. Here are some possibilities that you can write a grant. Here are some ways you can do research. So we just provide like that, um, that support, but it's their choice how they want to take it. We are just there to help them out. Like for example, with these teens that they are trying to get data from first generation forages. Um, so what we, I have done is that I've taken their question or their link to their survey and shared it across the different states in the country because we have access to those people and they don't. So we are sharing it out them, with them, but they again with their national leadership, some of them are you know, reaching out to their peers nationally to kind of share about their survey and getting responses there too. And then there was one more also from Stephanie, which is what are the common themes in response to why the youth are engaging? I think the common theme is that uh, focusing on the needs of their community, the youths that the, the community that they come from and how we can look at programming differently. Can we, uh, can we do something that is different that does not have a specific focus on this priority area? Can we uh, you know, intertwine or work collaboratively between two priority areas? So, and I think the best thing, something sometimes they will share is like so power empowering that one of the youths shared with me that, hey, I, I saw that I'm working a lot with LGBT youths, but I do not have any um, connection with, uh, uh, you know, with mental health. Can you make for me that connection? So they see that, you know, these issues are not isolated. They're all intertwined. So they help, want us to make that connection for them. Okay, we have another one from Alan, which is what was implemented to provide resources needed to attend ISU? Can you, um, can you share again that question? Yeah, I'll share it. And, and Alan, maybe if you're able to unmute, but the question again was what was implemented to provide resources needed to attend ISU? What resources they received when they, when they were here? What was implemented to provide resources? Yeah. Yeah, you stated this, Alan. You stated that um, one of the things that they said was a top priority or need was that they needed resources um, to even attend I, uh, Iowa State, or they needed uh, help writing uh, letters uh, for um, scholarships and those types of things. So I was wondering, what did you implement to help them uh, along that uh, that uh, requirement? Well, there's some of the resources that we provide to them is uh, transportation is a big need and we provide that. And then um, sometimes computers is a big need for them to attend sessions like that are virtual. And what we have seen and like some places like Storm Lake, what we have done is that we've um, brought the youths to the campus, to the extension office and have done the sessions from the extension office. So sometimes we do that, but then I think a lot of the times the resources are people, the connections, and um, you know, bringing those connections to their community and to show that how they can be, you know, how they can empower us. Like taking, like for example, I'm part of a research team, the <clears throat> NSF grant project that I'm working on at Storm Lake, um, that needs to see that how we can do co-creation. But when we went there, we didn't go there as experts. We asked the youths to be our experts, to tell us about your community. What is the need in your community? So that was empowering for them to see that they can also share their perspective to a scholarly research team. So giving those resources can be like providing those opportunities, Ellen.
Those are all of the questions that I see that were posted either in the chat or the Q&A. Okay. Yeah, Art Force Iowa is a really good uh, program and um, really appreciated the work they are doing with the young people. Well, thank you everyone for attending. And, and if you are able to go onto Whova and to um, fill out the evaluation form, uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sarah, for mm -hmm. being the host. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Yep, bye. Bye.